I mean, you know me, I mean, I demand some sort of intellectual rigor and I also, I don't want their half-assed ideas presented to me like, uh, you know, some happy puppy um, catching a small rabbit, you know, and wanting a pat. It's hard creatively to continually to come up with these ideas and when I ask them for something, I want to complete ideas, you know, things that we could get onto the menu. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Over the last year, we've talked about how Australia is a melting pot of the world's culinary offerings, how wave after wave of migration patterns have introduced new and exciting cuisines over generations. But of course, there are those challenging the realms of gastronomy too, who have not only put Australia on the global map, but become seminal restaurants that nurtured the next generation to become part of a new wave of Australian dining. Mark Best is one of Australia's most influential chefs and restaurateurs, who amongst many things owned Mark, which featured for three years running in the San Pellegrino World's 50 Best Restaurant list and held three hats in the Sydney Morning Herald Good Food Guide for 10 years running. Mark, how are you going? Good, my friend. How are you? I'm good. It's great to have you on the show. Very much looking forward to taking the deep dive with you. You're one of the most influential um, food people in Australia's history, and yet you kind of fell into cooking accidentally. Did did you ever have visions that, you know, you would end up at that point? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Plenty of plenty of visions, but uh, <laughs> beer induced and dehydration. But uh, um, no, I didn't. Um, you know, it would be <laughs> it would be inaccurate and immodest to say that I did. Um, I only ever my ambition only ever slightly superseded my uh, current technical ability, and uh, was always sort of chasing chasing that that sort of uh, tail the entire time. I know the um, sort of story of how you fell into the industry and um, and got started as a well-trodden path, but was was there times when you realised that sort of drive for perfection that sort of clicked in because it's been a real um, sort of hallmark of what you do? Um, look, it's only with hindsight that I can say with any clarity that um, I, I was sort of born for this job in a way. I mean, I've just received... Um, several packages that I inherited um, from my matriarchal side, you know, going back to my great-great-grandmother and received my handwritten recipe book from my um, great-grandmother, which I'm sort of, I'm putting together, trying to put together a book, uh, any publishers out there, but um, but it's just absolutely quite amazing just to see uh, these recipes um, just annotated, you know, my great grandmother. I think she was twelve when she started writing this book. Um, she was born in eighteen eighty five, and the the, fir- the first page underlined quite neatly in that sort of copper plate script is um, "cooking book," <laughs> which is you know. And then these beautiful recipes. I mean, they came from uh, they emigrated from Silesia. My great great grandmother did from Silesia in about 1865, which is part of Poland. And so, you know, I didn't know any of this, and um, all of those childhoods in Tanunda in the Brossa Valley that sort of continue to inform me and um, those that sort of taste memory that never goes away. My uh, likes and dislikes, etc., all stem from those days and. Uh, mm. Did I have any inkling that I was going to be a professional chef? No, I did not. But uh, I was, uh, I've been I've well trained for this situation. You uh, created or you, you learned a heavy backbone in French uh, cookery, which created the foundation for what you did throughout your career. Those early days, what, what was it like? What was it that really got you going about being in the industry? Um, look, I... At this time, you know, I'd, um, you know, this is a fairly well-trodden story, but, you know, I started, in, I was in Norseman, a small town uh, at the end of the Nullarbor, um, T-junction at the end of the Nullarbor, if you want to be accurate. There's Norseman, and uh, I was an electrician underground, and uh, I left there, you know, when I was 21 um, and came to Sydney and uh, ended up working on the submarines on Cockatoo Island before it was a, an art space. 
And by that time, I was so thoroughly <laughs> desperate, you know, and thinking this, this, I could just uh, see my life, you know, I could see all, <laughs> all, all the entrenched journeymen on that on that island, all these unionized guys working for the painters and dockers, etc. And uh, you know, and they're just counting the days until their retirement. I thought this isn't my life, and so um, I decided I was going to go and work in a cafe and that uh, that pipe dream of work life balance and serve a few cappuccinos, which I'd only just discovered on arriving in Sydney. And um, so I my first job that I uh, got out of uh, being a sparky was to go and apply for a dish hand job at Dick's Hotel in Balmain at the Roundabout. And I think I opened a can of uh, can of refried beans and uh, a couple of other tins. And evidently, <laughs> I didn't pass muster, and they didn't give me the job. I had no idea to this day what I did wrong. But uh, again, luckily, it was sort of happenstance turned out. My my flatmate in Balmain was uh, Linda Robertson, who was at that time head chef at Maclay Street Bistro, and that was sort of one of the first real modern Australian bistros at the time of, um, you know, Bayswater Brasserie had, uh, was new, et cetera. Um, things are exciting. It was the first time I'd ever tried a Kalamata olive or that magical stuff, balsamic vinegar, was the first time they put it on my tongue. It was like ambrosia. So they were exciting times and it just, you know, and um, Linda said, look, before you throw your life away, why don't you come and try a day in the kitchen? It's very, very difficult. and um, you know, just see if you're at least suited. And by the end of the day, she offered me a job and I started my second apprenticeship. You worked uh, in many sort of uh, iterations of French over the years. And and Mark Restaurant, uh, you know, that was contemporary Australian, really groundbreaking, um, absolutely flooring some people and intimidating others. You know, at what point did you steer towards that sort of model and to take dining and Australian gastronomy to that that level? Um, I, th I think the French thing only really came from, um, you know, it's a bit like why people are entranced with Emily in Paris now, you know, and I think back then, you know, uh, my the owner of the bistro, Daniel Gantius, was, was French and um, he gave me a book on French cuisine and, you know, we cooked the odd duck confit, et cetera, but uh, I went to Chef's Warehouse and... Uh, they had a fire sale, a literal fire sale, where things you know, was basically burnt down. Yeah. And uh, I, I picked up a book from a pile of charred remains uh, with no cover at all, and it was um, the Rue Brothers French Country Cooking where they went and they demonstrated maybe two to three different recipes from every department in France. And um, Valerie, my wife at that time, and I used this as a template to travel around France and went to all of these places and that's where my love of French cuisine came from, and specifically my love of uh, regional, regional French cuisine. And uh, so that's where the French thing came from. But getting back to it, I, it became increasingly uh, difficult to identify as a French chef with no other connection other than that. Um, and certainly I wanted to identify more as an Australian chef, and I think that was the... People like Neil Perry, etc., at Blue Water Grill were certainly embracing their nationality and their their white ethnicity, if I could say that term. But um, certainly more than anyone else. And um, so I think I wanted to get to be in part of that, and it was sort of the whole paddock to plate thing was starting. And um, the idea of using imported olive oil and imported products was beginning to be a bit of a hair shirt, if you know what I mean. And so I, we just started to try and identify more as an Australian an Australian restaurant using Australian products, you know, where we could. Mark opened in 1999. What, what was the culinary landscape like at that time? And, and um, tell us about your sort of initial thoughts when you were first opening that restaurant with what you were planning to do. Um, I had not long come back from uh, working at uh, Le Manoir Cut Saison um, in Oxfordshire in England. And before that, I'd done uh, nearly four months sort of extended self-funded stage at uh, Arpege for Alain Passard. 
Um, and that was, you know, the inspiration for the new place. We found a space uh, on Crown Street at that stage. Um, you really didn't want to go that side of Albion Street. It was uh, tumbleweed and uh, <laughs> speed-dealing bikies, you know, at the clock. So <laughs> it was dangerous and cheap. Um, but, um, you know, Surrey Hills was at the uh, beginning of that gentrification process. Um, so while you watched where you stood, you know, where you stepped and you held onto your wallet walking home at night, it certainly was for a startup, for a startup restaurant, uh, for people with no money and self-funded, that was, you know, what you had to do. But it was a good, it was a good spot and stood us in good stead for 17 years. Um, and we just, I guess, at the beginning, our intentions were modest. We just wanted to open a, a, a modern Australian bistro uh, serving smart casual food at a reasonable price. And uh, we were friends with an architect and uh, he got a bit excited and then we got a bit excited and he got more excited and we ended up with a design, meaning we had to rewrite the menu and uh, reimagine our entire concept. And that's how we came up with the fine dining restaurant. Do you think that was the moment that started pushing you to sort of test the realms of gastronomy, um, not only for Australia but globally as well? Um, look, we I th was very young and inexperienced, um, had a sort of a truncated uh, um, uh, sort of journey in terms of uh, my trade and, and uh so I just started like a lot of people do, trying to emulate um, emulate your heroes. And so my menu is basically made up of uh, about a third Alain Passard, a third uh, Raymond Blanc, and then a smattering of uh, uh, Pierre Gagne and a bit of Roger Verge. And uh, you know, off we went. And uh, they were they were hard but exhilarating days. And uh, gradually, uh, we let go of those crutches. As um, I've got some. Um, I guess some knowledge and uh, confidence to let go of those of those culinary crutches and um, you know uh, start my own voice. You know, in the early two thousands, fine dining restaurants are not known to make a lot of money, even though you know they're they're expensive to eat at. <laughs> you you invested all of your own money in a in a very small site as well. Seventeen years is extraordinary for a restaurant's longevity. What were the challenges involved in maintaining those supreme standards you had and viability? Well, it was, you know, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, basically. I mean, you outline, you live a good life and, and I think is a, you know, a salient uh, warning to young chefs out there that when things are good, put your money in the bank. I remember telling that to, to Ben Sheary because uh, sitting where I'm sitting now and looking at my bank account, I wish I had a lot of that stuff back. Of course, I've had some amazing experiences and I've travelled all around the world several times, but uh, I probably wish at this stage of my life to uh, maybe have a bit of bit in my kicker. So I was just speaking to my mum as I told her this and she said, oh, yes, you got to half a century and you've just learnt that lesson. You know, she's been <laughs> from the country she's been telling me that since i was 11 so yeah anyway um forgot the question <laughs> well it, it was you know fine dining restaurants are just not known to actually make a lot of money and it's not necessarily as you alluded to about that it's about having a happier life and and pushing those realms and testing yourself what was the real driver for, for the restaurant for you look i don't even think uh you know the the quest for happiness is nothing. It's not something I pursued. I, I, I guess we had a some sort of weird artistic vision or some idea of where we wanted to be. Um, you know, some sort of feeling that you wanted to emulate. You know, on the plate and in the dining room and the type of establishment you wanted to run. Um, you know, and I had. Um, those times at Arpege, and I think that was the that was the template for that that small bespoke experience where everything was done in house, um, and we wanted to do that um, in an Australian way, um, and we just we just sort of built on things. It was a long time uh, before we even did a degustation menu, but I remember I remember wanting to be up there with the Tetsiers of the time and the banks and you know. 
etc with Liam Tomlin and those type of people and the rock pools etc um, wanting to be up there and uh, we offered a three course a la carte and um, the critics at the time were having 14 courses at Tetsuya's and then coming in and having a entree and dessert because it was reviewing time at mine. <laughs> and I thought, well, how in the fuck can I compete at this level? <laughs> so that's why I decided to do <laughs> degustation only, just to keep the critics honest. Tetsuya's is known for some incredible alumni, but um, Mark as well is, you, you know, talking Dan Hong, Dan Puskas, Brent Savage, Passy Patanen. What was it like? in that kitchen in those early days with all those young chefs that have gone on to do amazing things? Um, look, it was, it was, it was tough. And I mean, it was a tough kitchen. Um, I mean, Dan Hong still says to me that it was the toughest experience he's ever had. And I think people get the wrong idea of that as if, you know, he was, he was beaten regularly. Um, I probably would say he wasn't beaten regularly enough, but, <laughs> um, but it is because, I mean, you know me, I mean, I have uh, uh, demand some sort of intellectual rigour and I also, I don't want their half-assed ideas presented to me like, uh, you know, some happy puppy um, catching a small rabbit, you know, and wanting it pat. You know, I want, I wanted to fully, it's hard creatively to continually to come up with these ideas. And when I asked them for something, I wanted to complete ideas, you know, things that we could get onto the menu. I mean, even Pussy would tell you how frustrated he was, how often I said no to him, you know, like a good editor, you know, you say no a hundred times and yes, once if you're lucky. And that's the same process with, with running a restaurant like that. You, I make no claim to their talent whatsoever. I recruited I recruited good people and they paid me off. Uh, and in return, I taught them how to, I think, run a run a business efficiently. I taught them how to cook in every part of the restaurant, not just coming from the sorbet section at Tetsuya's or the the comfy ocean trout section at Tetsuya's, but I threw them straight into pastry and they would complain bitterly, you know, because they had no experience there. But I threw them in there and forced them to, to learn to learn the section of it was you know mind blowing to me that that they didn't want to learn you know an intrinsic part of um <laughs> the entire industry you know that they are happy just with this with a portion of it you know so that's where Pussy and I um came together i mean we we both spent uh, the, our formative years as pastry chefs so that's how I trained as well for 4 years as a pastry chef before going into the savory kitchen and Pussy was the same so it was. I was never scared of that. You know. um, in the past, we've spoken, and you've described a situation that you feel, and the way that you operate, as a, a eternal dissatisfaction, and that's a driving point for you. Can Can you dive into that and explain how that manifests in what you do? It turns out it was just low serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, we fix that up. Uh, no, it was just. I think it's just a general frustration that people that people feel when you're not you're just not quite getting there. I mean, I feel the same now. You know, writing. I mean, it just seems like pour out of my brain like thick and treacle. You know, it's just such a uh, such a long process, and um, that eternal was that, that sort of. I was, I was sort of alluding also to that. Uh, the ephemeral nature of when you're creating things is that it takes you so long to get somewhere and you think you've reached a point and there's a moment of satisfaction and then it's gone and you're on you're on to the next thing. And I think that's what I was alluding to with that 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 comment. But um it's it continued to be ephemeral and the, the moment it isn't is when you're just relying on your your back catalogue and you're gone. That manifested on the plate at Mark and do you really polarise people where you, you know, took their breath away or they just didn't get it? Um, tell us about that process because I know for you it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily matter if everyone loves what you do. Look, I <laughs> I think I was, I think I was pretty arrogant in thinking that, you know, if 50% didn't like it, they could really go fuck themselves because <laughs> because I knew what I, I knew its intrinsic value. I mean, Miffy Rigby wrote about it and said that I was so bloody minded that um, I fed her five times in a row something that she 
actively disliked, <laughs> you know. But that's just that was just you know sort of who I am. You know, I, I've hopefully I've calmed down a bit, but you know, I just wanted to convince people. You know, I just if I saw value in something or I I knew that intrinsically that it was right, you know, I would uh, rather than let them have their way, I would uh, try and convince them. And, and at the same time, trying to convince myself, I guess. So. You've done a lot since um, you closed, Mark, and moved on to to do many other things. Well, tell us about your cooking, though, these days compared to Mark, because Mark really tested the realms of gastronomy, and you do many things these days. What, what is co- cooking like for you compared to those days? Uh, it's more enjoyable now, I have to say. Um, Running a running a an ongoing art project and trying to make a living out of it is, is very difficult. Um, but you know, I've learned an enormous amount of skills. I developed uh, as a chef and a and a person, and um, I think I've I've developed, uh, I guess, through practice, thousands of hours of practice. I've developed an intuition, so things come easily to me now combinations and ideas that I previously previously struggled with and it takes all of these years to to get to that point so in that in that way it's satisfying and a lot of the things that I do you know working for AEG or promoting you know food products like Margaret Lamb or working on the ships you know having restaurants I mean everything the same rules apply it's just a different scale well, you do have the, as you just alluded to, the restaurants on the luxury ships, which um, you know would have been impacted in the last year. Um, give it, give us a sense of what it takes to create a good restaurant on a ship like that, and and what, and perhaps what the impact of COVID might have, might be on that whole industry. Um, well, in defence of Dream Cruises, you know we were we were the the first um, one of the first lines uh, major lines to withdraw from the the cruising we cancelled everything refunded everything and uh, we went back to port and the three the three ships which were worth a billion us each uh the the two big ones they're a billion each uh went to went to port um in port kalang in malaysia at anchor with a skeleton crew and even even running those ships with a skeleton crew costs a fortune because you know there's the systems have to be maintained otherwise uh, they, they you know it's not good for them um so anyway it was the, the trouble was with um obviously the american min- administration denying that there was even a even a pandemic approaching the people were the american lines like carnival based out of florida were still taking on you know, still taking on passengers as um, the deaths were mounting around the world. So that was the whole Ruby Princess debacle, etc. So, you know, we've borne the brunt as a, you know, the whole uh, cr- uh, ship as a Petri dish trope that, that runs around. Um, but it's nothing like that. And anyway, our, our ships are now getting going again. And uh, after a year, um, in hiatus, and so they're within. One is in the quarantine zone of Singapore, and one in the quarantine zone of Taiwan, and they're doing very, very well with uh, on their in their international waters, um, and haven't had one incident. Tell us about those restaurants. Um, yeah, so I have three restaurants. They're basically a grill. Um, it's you know I travel to them a fair bit over the year um, and train everyone up. I mean, I joined uh, Dream Cruise Lines when it was still in the shipyards in Germany in Bremerhaven and uh, we started from there. So it was pretty nice to be in on the ground from there and uh, and then training, training everyone, you know, and uh, it was more my, as much my chef skills as my restaurateur skills, training everyone in the art of service, etc. cetera. Um, we're in the kitchen were mostly, um, you know, the, Standard ships crew of Indonesian, uh, Filipino, um, Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, and on the front of house were all Mandarin-speaking culinary students who had never, 
who had never seen a, a, a real operating restaurant. So starting from scratch um, before we picked up our first um, 6,000 passengers after a seven-week journey from Germany through the Suez Canal down to, down to India and into Hong Kong. So we had seven weeks to do that. Um, it was an amazing, incredible time, actually, um, to be going down the Suez Canal with gunships from uh, Egypt flying alongside <laughs> and being in convoys down through, you know, Somalia and that uh, in in a convoy, so that type of thing. So it's you know an amazing adventure. Um, but um, in terms of the ship, you know, the ship restaurants itself, it's a, just a matter of uh, a new audience. Um, I think I went in there thinking that I would do a, a very modern Australian take on, you know, um, I guess Chinese food and. Uh, and then realizing fairly quickly that it was completely patronizing. I guess as a as an example, uh, doing a what I thought was incredible congee, you know, with with dashi and foie gras and bits and pieces, thinking that would be impressive, and then realizing that you know congee really was the the chicken soup of <laughs> of, of Asian cuisine, and it was a very specific, uh, cul- you know, cultural references, and so it was lessons like that 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 I learned um, cultural lessons, very important ones, in fact, that um, you know just showed me which was the truly exciting thing for me. That um, I, I told you before about you know the first time I tried Kalamata olives and balsamic vinegar at Bayswater Brasserie, or my first freshly chucked oyster, etc. I mean, this was equivalent to that time, um, even at, because I just there was just an entire universe that you know I had no idea of. So that that's the learning part that I enjoy the most. You've, you're doing so many things and have done so many things since Mark. It'd be impossible to list them all. But one of the, one of the really fascinating ones in the last couple of years was the the final table where you participated with Shane Osborne. How did that come about to do that, and what was the experience like? Um, I came to, I think they had done, uh, they'd done a, uh, a worldwide casting, uh, net. Um, I hadn't been picked up in that, but Shane had in Hong Kong and they asked him, uh, to pick, to, to pick one person that he would most like to work with and anyway chose me. So that's how I came about it. And then we went through an exhaustive, uh, evaluation uh, locally um, a couple of different psych tests etc um, sent in videos etc um, and eventually got through that casting process and uh, we ended up uh, ended up in West Hollywood staying at the Sofitel um, it's quite amazing uh, I think we turned up at the Sofitel um, only Shane and I knew each other and we were didn't really know anyone else there. Um, quite a few young Australians. I think there was probably about thirty odd chefs at the Sofitel at that time. Um, and we went out to uh, Culver City to Sony Studios, the biggest studio there. And uh, I remember we went through the casting process. They had uh, wooden chairs lined up, and the producers um, from Old School TV who were producing the the show basically gave us a questionnaire and uh, we had to do a bit of a cook off um, and the producers ran around between us and then they put us on uh, two small buses. Anyway, one small bus uh, went on to the uh, production studio and the other small bus went back to the hotel. <laughs> so, <it> was, <laughs> so it really sucked to be the second one. <laughs> yeah. So, and it was an amazing experience. And I mean, uh, to be honest, um, in, in real terms, you know, having been worked with on MasterChef, etc., cetera, um, not, not as a contestant, but, you know, working with MasterChef, there was a whole uh, lot of smoke and mirrors making, making the contestants on that look good. But working with um, other chefs um, at our at our professional with our professional ability, even the producers who had um, produced things like the F word for Gordon Ramsay and Hell's Kitchen and Master Chef Kids and UK etc. 
Um, they're pretty soon sacked the stylists, as all of us, you know, said no one's touching our food as, as, <laughs> as it's plated, you know. So they had to completely change it, and it was a learning curve for them as well. So it was fantastic. And so it was really uh, an amazing an amazing experience and incredibly stressful. And I think Shane and I still talk about it as we do it with a lot of the other alumni from that show about uh, how we used every ounce of our, of our previous experience for that show, which is quite incredible. It was really a, really a test. One of the really interesting things to observe from afar is um, the photography uh, interest that you have. Uh, mm. Where did where did that um, come about from? And and tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've done. Um, so, I think I was lucky enough to go to school in South Australia in Murray Bridge at that time. You know, Don Dunstan, very progressive. You know, South Australian premier, and we had. Uh, all sorts of uh, educational units, you know. We were all forced to do, you know, home economics, boys and girls, and uh, other other trade crafts, etc. and photography being one of them. So I think uh, when I was about 12 or 13, we learnt how to make pinhole cameras and um, go into the studio and develop the film, and that went on to working, you know, using 35 mil cameras and developing that film and developing an idea. And then I sort of, it went into hiatus as we sort of went into the digital age because of, uh, for technical reasons. And, the, but I've always kept up. So it predates, you know, predates my working life. Um, and I've always, I've always enjoyed it. And I think it's only probably the past 15 years that I've really got stuck back into it again. And, uh, sort of developed developed my skill with it like everything else it turns out that it's an enormous amounts of practice you know to to get to get to make it look easy there's different skills involved and and different mediums as well and do you prefer portraiture or food or is there is there an area that really interests you in regards to photography um it it, it it's quite interesting that the same rules that apply, you know, say in architecture or photography, et cetera, um, the rules of uh, composure and uh, proportion, things like that, um, texture, et cetera, the same rules apply to food. So this, this, the skills are, are compatible and inform, inform each other. And so that's why often, you know, if I – even back in Mark days, if I was looking for inspiration, I wouldn't read food books because I found that derivative, and you end up you end up uh, copying other chefs. So, if you were looking for original ideas, it would be was better to look at other disciplines. And photography was one of them. And I was also interested in architecture and design, and the great architects and modernist architects. I found far more informative in terms of food, and people might find that strange, but um look it's it's about it's about when you're being creative it's um I, the, the first point is not copying anyone else that's the first hurdle if you want to talk about creativity and the second one is you know to come up with an original idea once you have the idea you don't need the recipes um which is why at this day I don't know half my recipes because I would say this is the idea this is what I want it to look like make it happen so I I'd tell the guys and then they would they would come up with the recipes so I'm just that was just the the way I worked um, in terms of photography I prefer portraiture I um, again I it gets me in trouble because my portraits don't flatter people it just has to the picture has to resonate with me and it has to tell me uh, a truth about that person that I see in my mind's eye. And so people, Vanya, Vanya Cullen, you know, didn't talk to me for quite a while because I took a photo of her and she said that I was very cruel and unkind. And I said, well, I never meant to be, you know. Um, there's a rule in photography, though, if you don't like your portrait, if you want a better portrait, get a better head. But that's... That's not really helping me, is it? But um, but I like I like I like the rawness of photography. I want you know you want to display like you want it on a plate. You want to elicit some emotion. You know what I mean. So if you're into 
if you want to flatter, you know, you do a slow cooked uh, lamb shoulder, and everyone, all the foodies think they're an incredibly uh, evolved, you know, because they can pick out the uh, the different types of peppercorns. But you know, the same, it's the same with uh, with photography. I like to just elicit an emotion. And that Angus, Angus, fine, um, but I hope, I hope that it, you know, tells a, a broader story. Uh, your legacy will forever have a, a major footprint on Australia's culinary landscape. I'm too how, young for legacy, mate. <laughs> how, how do you feel about the uh, Australian culinary landscape at the moment and um, what excites you about what's happening in food in Australia? Look, COVID, COVID aside, we're, we're, you know, obviously it's a, it's a tragedy. So what's happening to the... Uh, to the restaurant yeah. scene with COVID, and that's that's worldwide. But um, we're doing better than better than a lot, and how we will come through this, and who will survive, um, it's it's uh, it's terrible. Um, who knows? But um, in, in general, what excites me is seeing. Uh, I think a lot of smaller places opening. Um, um, one one to go back to COVID point, the one the one thing I enjoy about COVID in our industry is the uh the sort of the squashing of um of celebrity that was completely out of control. Um and all the peripheral the peripheral uh industries mm-hmm. and people around in the circus around around that celebrity, world's fifty best, etc. Notwithstanding and, and everything else. Um and I like getting back in terms of even the journalism, and I hope that it doesn't go back there of scoring of scoring places. Even if I love the idea of reviewing new places, but but adding a number um, is just completely banal. And I hope we don't go back there. Um, I mm. encourage anyone I talk to that we can't go go back to those. We have to move on, you know, to some new thought. And one of the things that excites me is seeing how people have um, made it work um, during the COVID times, you know, like even my next door neighbor, Flavio at Marta, you know, he just goes, I didn't even know he was a chef, to be honest. I thought he's just a waiter for Vitelli. And then it turns out he's a, a genius Roman pastry chef. And he came up with all this foyatella and the, you know, the schiacciatore and all this sort of stuff at it. And I'm going, where the hell did you come from? And it is it completely reinvented his business. That's his new model, you know, and that type of thing excited me during COVID, you know, seeing Ben Shuri heading out and doing his summer school and stuff like that, you know, that excites me. And I'm sure Attica and the entity that was, was boring him as well. I know it was, you know, and so, uh, you know, I like going out to seeing my old, Mm. Head uh, Maitre D. Arcot. He's at Circa Espresso at Parramatta. You know, we head out and we see you know Af- Af- Afghani immigrants. Sorry, we head out and we see um, you know he takes us out. He's Kurdish and he takes us out and shows me where the Afghani immigrants are making uh, flatbread and all this sort of stuff and bringing their culture to Sydney. And I think I think it's exploring that diversity. Um, that is beautiful, and even I've lost interest in I've lost interest in fine dining and that whole whole thing. If I if you wanted to take me to a, a degustation or extended menu now, I'd rather chew my own leg off than sit through it. I mean, it, it's it's just it's just theatre these days, and bad theatre at that. And I've been there. No one's coming up with anything new other than on a smaller front where people are starting to explore their own cultures and coming up with things that I've never seen before, you know, beautiful things. And, and I think that's where the, the industry is going. Well, I know, I know you've got a lot on your plate. Is there anything exciting that um, you've got in the works for the, for the next year that you can tell us about? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> brilliant um well, that's a good answer um 
But I do look forward to, it sounds like you are putting together some sort of book. Um, no doubt it sounds like it's frustrating and we might um, see, it, see it come to fruition at some stage soon. Um, Mark, I think we could uh, probably do like three episodes with you. We might touch base again down the, down the track. Yeah, happy to, happy to add to this one. So, yeah, there's, <laughs> lot, there's, I mean, there's lots more we could talk about. Um, there's, there's lots going on and, you know, so... Absolutely. I think we might um, touch base again in a couple of months and dig dig deeper again. But we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds, um, especially for our 200th episode as well. We're honoured to have you on. Thank you. Um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Lovely. Thanks, mate. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>